banks and companies. Well, the topic of this panel uh, is a pretty interesting one. It's Congress, Technology, and the Tea Party. We'll see what this group uh, thinks those three groups have in common. And uh, to kind of help us get started on this uh, effort, let me introduce Elizabeth Frazee, who is, the, uh, who is the, from Twin Logic Strategies. Elizabeth? Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Rick. Um, this is going to be an interesting panel talking about the new Congress and what the conservative movement means for us with our technology issues. Change has certainly come to Washington. Congress has become more conservative. We heard from Representative Blackburn about some of her views on issues. And now we have a panel of experts that we're going to turn to and hear about their views. Um, the name of the panel, Congress, the Tea Party, and Technology, really is a metaphor for the conservative Congress. And we, um, we really don't know what to expect. So we're going to look into our crystal balls. I'm going to turn to the panelists, and I'll introduce them now. Um, our first panelist, Tom Davis, is former congressman and president and CEO of the Republican Main Street Partnership. He served in Congress representing Virginia's 11th congressional district for some 14 years. He was first elected in 1994 and was a leader on IT issues while in Congress. After retiring from Congress in 2008, Tom accepted a position as Director of Federal Government Affairs Director for Deloitte LLP. Um, probably most important for our panel is Tom's encyclopedic knowledge of congressional um, political minutiae, and he has often lectured members of Congress on the electoral history of their own districts. We also have Ray Ramsey. He's president and CEO of TechNet, a bipartisan political network of CEOs and senior executives of leading U.S. technology companies. He was previously CEO of One Economy, president and CEO of the Enterprise Foundation, and served as Oregon's Director of Housing and Community Services. And finally, we have Amy Schatz. Um, she's a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, covering the FCC and technology policy. She joined the Wall Street Journal in 2004 from the Austin American Statesman, where she covered Dell, Inc. And she began her career covering business at the St. Petersburg Times. And Rick, I certainly hope you'll feel free to join in our discussion as well, because you bring a great perspective. So to kick things off, I was going to ask Tom a question first. Um, you bring the perspective of having been part of the Republican wave to Congress in 1994. Is this deja vu all over again, or is it truly unique? Um, and just how different are the views of the new Tea Party members of Congress? Will they want to um, take an even more hands-off approach to government than the approach the Republican leadership is willing to take? Elizabeth, let, me, uh, let me start by saying the most important part of my introduction you left out, and that is that I left Congress undefeated and unindicted. In exactly. something yeah. like Yay! <laughs> but, um, there's, there are a lot of differences with this in the 1994 crowd. First of all, the parties are much more ideologically sorted than they were in 1994. In 1994, you had a, 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 a lot of very moderate to liberal Republicans, Steve Horn, Connie Morella. You could, the, we had representation in Massachusetts, yeah. Connecticut. Um, the party has shifted south and west. Uh, the Blue Dogs, uh, they got run over last November. They're now dead dogs. There aren't many moderate Democrats left. You basically have liberals and conservatives, and the parties are ideologically sorted. And that means a lot when you start talking about how you're engaged in policy. But most importantly, reinforcing that are two other major factors. One is that uh, the media has changed markedly since 1994. There was no Internet to speak of in 1994 as we know it. Uh, and with the growth of the net and the blogs, um, the uh, online newspapers, uh, the sorting out of Fox and MSNBC, that for people now cognitive dissonance, people tune into what they want to tune in. They get their information that way. It means if John Boehner went up to this afternoon and cut a deal with uh, the President Obama, it could be undone by the time he gets back to the Capitol. Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh get on the air, and all of a sudden, in terms of communication with the grassroots, it's not the political leaders anymore. It's some of these communication leaders uh, that, that uh, they have to contend with. 
And then finally, look at the way campaigns are funded today. This last uh, campaign, you had more money spent by interest groups on the fringes than you did by the parties and the candidates. That's a result of campaign finance reform, the Citizens United decision, and the like. So that when you talk about members and the incentives, what they don't want are some of these interest groups, right and left, getting into their primaries. Uh, that is, uh, you know, nobody wants to be the next uh, Robert Bennett. Uh, nobody wants to be the next Mike Castle. This is, uh, nobody wants to be the next Joe Lieber, where you look at your own primary and you're out of sync with your caucus and your base voters who now have all the, the, the financing and the media on their sides. This is huge to a huge polarization uh, that is now uh, reflected not just ideologically but in a partisan mode in Washington. And we didn't have that in 94. So does that mean that the Republican leadership will move more toward the Tea Party? Uh, they've got to tame, they certainly have to contend with the Tea Party at this point. They've got to, the Tea Party and the Republican Party are not married. They are just, they're, they're dating. Uh, and at this point, they're trying to get, make sure this coalition remains part of the Republican coalition. There are actually some surveys that show the Tea Party with higher favorable ratings with the Republicans than the Republican Party. This was right after Bush, and over time, maybe that diminishes a little bit. But uh, they are still according each other and watching each other warily. And the Republican leadership has to be cognizant of that as they make their decisions on some of these budgetary and regulatory decisions. Great. So, Ray, um, some of TechNet's federal uh, priorities have been broadband deployment and highly skilled labor um, immigration reform. Are you worried that the new congressional focus on the budget and comprehensive immigration reform might keep TechNet from pushing forward on your agenda? Well, let me say this, and, and it's not just uh, rhetorical. We have always been uh, bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So the, and, and I don't claim to have any particular insight on the Tea Party movement, but in terms of conservative, liberal, um, you know, I think our sector cuts across all of that. And it's, it's not about an ideological fight, it's about a couple of things. One is, uh, we had a, a retreat uh, with a number of our leaders, and we asked Greg Walden to come um, and speak, and sort of, since he was um, heading the transition for, for Speaker Boehner, and talk about his priorities, and we also spoke about ours. And there were far more similar points than one would sort of, if you were stereotyping this, believe. Um, we've always looked at the budgetary process as one that shouldn't just be made up of do we allocate or don't we allocate, but one that should be based in a qualitative analysis. What should we be investing in? So we still make the case that we should be making investments in innovation, uh, uh, STEM-related um, human resource uh, issues, uh, making investments in basic infrastructure, and we don't try to involve ourselves in, well, should this agency grow or that agency grow, because for us it's not an allocation system, it's qualitative. And so I think there's opportunities there, and, and in speaking with, with the congressman and with others, I think we have opportunities to make a good case, uh, even in a restricted uh, budgetary sense, because again, it's not all about allocation. If you look at the visa issue, that's not about a money allocation. That's about a philosophy of human capital. So, and I think we have opportunities there. Does anybody else have anything to add on that subject on our panel? I mean, I think one of the things that you're going to be seeing, especially with the times when you're talking about the allocation and, and how much Congress might be spending on, on things like broadband deployment now. I mean, you just saw $8 billion in stimulus that came out last year that everybody's still spending even though they say that millions of jobs have been created, but it's not clear how millions have been created since most of the money still really hasn't sort of been hitting any place yet, and that will be this year. But, you know, the other thing that they're going to be looking at, especially on the FCC side, is ways to reform Universal Service Fund, which is one of the wonkiest and most horrible issues for any congressional committee to have to deal with. And uh, certainly Rick Bauscher made a, a good faith effort at it for multiple years, uh, and I'm sure uh, other members were happy he took that on. Um, but that's something that, you know, it's an $8 billion a year fund and they'd like to spend it on broadband. And when you've got that kind of money and you're talking about shifting that from telephone to broadband, you know, there's going to be a big fight on that. So that's going to be one that would be interesting to look at when you're seeing how the new wave of, of Republicans who've come into Congress, how that's really going to impact things. Tom? Well, underlying all this is the fact that uh, for every dollar the government spent last year, they borrowed 41 cents. 
Uh, this is an unsustainable model. I think uh, the Tea Party uh, is going to hold the party's feet to the fire on these kind of issues. I think you can look for some rescissions. Uh, both parties are reluctant to cut where the money is, and that's in the entitlements, the wealth redistribution and the generational redistribution that's going on. I mean, I'm surprised, for example, tech, you take a look at where the money is going. It's going to Social Security. It's going to Medicare. It's going to Medicaid. It put 80 percent as hospital beds, mostly for the elderly. It's going for debt service. We are basically investing uh, in retirees, not in the future. Uh, and so, and that's what we are spending. That's how we spend our money, notwithstanding not the fact we borrow 41 cents for every dollar a week can, we can make. So we're in the General Motors model right now as a country. We're just invested in our retirees and not in the, in the future. And I think one of the things the Tea Party brings is, is there's, they're looking at this and saying this just isn't right, the numbers don't add up, and that will push, I think, the Republican uh, Party in the direction on the spending side. Now, on the tax side, uh, we saw what happened uh, you know, in December. Uh, Congress went to extend the Bush tax cuts, and then they added unemployment comp, they, uh, an AMT fix, a doc fix. By the time you were through, they were at the buffet table, and the uh, deficit grew another $200 billion. Uh, everybody said, gee, we work together as a party, but it just drove the deficit in the out years up. And we're going to have an early indication of where this goes when Congress has to raise the debt ceiling. And we'll see at this point what kind of, uh, what they couple that with. I don't think you'll see a straight uh, debt ceiling uh, agreement uh, without some kind of cutbacks in spending. But I fear that the concentrations will be on the discretionary domestic side of the, of the table. And that hits into a lot of programs that are important to the tech industry. Yeah, and, and let me let me comment. Um, when Amy brought up the um, universal service, which is close to nine billion dollars a year, and programs like that, there is no sense with within our membership that that amount will grow. So we're looking at operating within that. But what will be interesting with the new Congress is what will be the guiding philosophy uh, around those dollars and. Will we be thinking about an investment approach? How would you best spend you know, close to $9 billion uh, in this day and age? Um, what are we trying to foster by universal service? And then you have issues like um, spectrum and spectrum allocation, which is a big issue. And again, what remains to be seen is what will be the guiding philosophy around that? So there are still lots of issues uh, that Congress will deal with and the regulatory agencies will deal with which aren't about just the allocation of dollars. It will really get to what is the guiding philosophy. And as the congressman said, it's like, what are we choosing to invest in uh, as society? So I think that there are some interesting philosophical um, issues here that will also create some interesting alliances um, that you might not otherwise expect. Because again, the tech sector is very interested in, in how do we invest in the workforce of the future. Rick, you picked up the microphone. I had to get the microphone because, boy, I've got a few things to say now. Um, actually, just two things. You know, um, it's interesting to hear the discussion of the Tea Party juxtaposed with tech policy because, you know, I ran in several elections, and I don't think tech policy, even in my district, which included Microsoft and everybody else in Seattle, ever drove, you know, any appreciable number right. of votes. So I think it's unlikely that the Tea Party is really focused on most of the tech policy issues that we focus on. Having said that, um, one of the things that really has not changed, and one of the things that's kind of remarkable to me, is that uh, when we founded the, the Internet Caucus you know, 15 years ago, really the big issue on our horizon was how do we hit the right balance in terms of government involvement in the Internet? You want it to prosper, but it also you know, has to be a fair system, so the government has to have some rules. And uh, you know, that's the balance that we were fighting then. It's exactly the same balance we're fighting now. That, that issue really hasn't changed. Some of the details have changed, but we still, and we probably always, you know, will be trying to figure out exactly what is the right balance in terms of government intervention and government keeping its hands off. Um, I do think the... Uh, the uh, Tea Party movement and the, the new Congress will have an impact on that. I think mm -hmm. the likelihood is you'll see less government involvement. You'll strike the balance a little bit more on the side of having lesser involvement. Of course, from my perspective, that's probably a positive thing. But in terms of uh, really helping us sort out the details of these technology policies, I doubt the Tea, tea Party is going to have a whole lot of guidance for us. There is one issue that they seem to have focused on, and that's Internet freedom. And so I wanted to turn to Amy to hear what she thinks might happen on net neutrality. We saw um, Red State conservative blog come out back in September and endorse the Waxman Compromise on net neutrality. Then the Republicans in the House didn't support it. It fell apart. 
Then we saw the FCC come out December 21st with their rules, and the Tea Party seems to be opposing those, and Representative Blackburn has her bill now that she talked a little bit about. So, Amy, where do you think things will stack up? So I don't know, every time I'm on one of these panels, I always get the net neutrality question, yeah. because it's always, I wonder why. <laughs> that's always the worst question. No, it's, um, it's actually it's funny, because when I first started this beat about six years ago, that was the first major story I did was on net neutrality, and everyone was still at that point, uh, ooh, what could happen someday? And, and here we are, six years later, we have rules. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so where we are right now is that the FCC has rules, and uh, they haven't published them in the Federal Register yet, so no one has been able to appeal them yet in federal court, but I know multiple lawyers around town who are already court shopping and trying to figure out what venue they could file this in, because they'd like to, uh, there's going to be probably multiple challenges to these, bill, to the, to these rules. Uh, and also you've got Representative Blackburn's uh, bill, which I think she's right, it probably will pass uh, the House uh, and relatively quickly, because there is a lot of concern among Republicans, not just Tea Party members, but uh, just a broader array of Republicans who are very concerned about uh, the, inter uh, the FCC getting involved in some of the minute parts of uh, how phone companies and cable companies um, change, you know, work on their networks and how they, they manage their networks. And you, know, you can somehow see it's not necessarily um, an unjustifiable fear because sometimes you know, the FCC doesn't necessarily move very quickly on anything and on the internet things move quite, quite fast. And so if you do have a, a problem you could see why um, some folks might not want this to end up in the FCC's court, where it can take upwards of a year. So, um, so you're probably yes, you probably will see uh, Representative Blackburn's bill pass uh, the House. Not not quite as sure on the Senate side. I'm not sure uh, Democrats over there are quite as, as thrilled about this because they have been uh, at least the leadership and generally supportive of what uh, Chairman Janikowski has done. But I think the real issue you you then run into, even if both both sides uh, in favor of it, is that it still has to go to the White House and. Uh, President Obama has been very supportive of, of the rules. Anybody else? I'll just add, I mean, the Senate, the Senate is the black hole. Um, you can pass anything out of the House. You'll see a lot of legislation come through the House, uh, some of it to satisfy the base uh, and other things. The House operates majority rule. Senate, you need 60 votes. And this is not just partisan in many aspects. This is taken on a partisan role, but it's also very interest group driven. And it, it took us years to pass a telecom bill. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, Rick was in the caucus with me the day Newt Gingrich came in at the end of a caucus and said, we're bringing the telecom conference report uh, to the uh, House floor tomorrow. And everybody looked astounded because this had been fought bitterly, campaign contributions, TV ads. And he said, it's okay. He said, we've got the r box. He said, we've got the long distance carriers. We've got the systems integrators. They've all agreed to it. And somebody yelled, everybody but the people. Uh, but this gets very interest group driven at the end of the day. Uh, and particularly in the Senate, you're going to see a lot. So it's, it's difficult to get anything out of Congress. Right? Yeah, and what, what I would add is, you know, without getting into the different bills, you know, because I, if, if you're being predictive, I, I would say that there is likely to be a bill that come through the House to rescind what the uh, FCC did. But having been involved in this and, and really caucusing a number of companies, I would say a couple of things. One is that there was an extraordinary amount of involvement um, from my perspective of companies, particularly coming out of the Silicon Valley, speaking to this issue. Um, one of my concerns, again, and this is not meant to be partisan, but one of my concerns is that we really need to look at this and say, will there be some unintended consequences um, by casting all of this in doubt again? Um, most of the companies want some level of certainty about what the playing field will look like. Um, and it's less about are there regs and aren't there regs, but are there a set of principles we can all believe in? The principles that the, this FCC was using, and again, I'm not speaking to saying that this was perfect you know, uh, rulemaking, were based on principles that uh, Chairman Powell put forward a number of years ago about transparency and openness and um, et cetera. And so those principles have withstood a test of time. So if we remove this regulatory oversight, the question will be how do we create something that will permit 
the, this set of principles to move forward. And, and I think that there may be some unintended consequences, and we have to be very careful. Because as you saw, there are interest groups that get involved, but you also saw a lot of key investment folks, venture capitalists, say, we think this is a light touch, and it's not bad. Rick, did you have anything to add to that one? Well, I will say, you know, the net neutrality, it is, it's gone on forever. And, you know, it's been, a, it's been a back and forth. I think the real question, I mean, uh, Ray is absolutely right. You do have to have some principles that underlie how things happen. The question is whether the government has to endorse and, and manage those principles. And I think that's still an open question. And there's one hopeful thing, one, one last comment I'll make on this, um, is as part of all of this, there were a group of folks that come together to create something called BTAG, which is uh, a technical advisory group, a business technical advisory group. So it, it represents a willingness of the commission to listen to sector folks, technology folks, to make technology-based decisions, non-political-based decisions. So I'm hoping that that will be able to grow and become more of a protocol at the commission. Continuing the conversation about internet regulation and where will the Tea Partiers stand on some issues that people in this room care about, um, in addition to net neutrality, where will the Tea Partiers be on issues like children's safety, um, privacy? Are they going to be hands on or are they going to be hands off? Um, will they? Will they? err on the side of protecting consumers, or will they believe that the free market can do that and they don't need government regulation to do so? That is, a, I'll take a stab at it. Um, the, you know, there are a lot of different tea parties. That's the, everybody looks exactly. at one tea party, we have a national platform. It doesn't right. work that way. Uh, what you have to remember, though, is that a lot of the winners in the tea party were from the South and West and they bring with them the culture of those areas, and they just bring that to, to Congress with them. Uh, uh, the p politics today, the partisan uh, divisions in this country are not economic. They are largely cultural. Uh, they are about values. Uh, they're not about money, uh, m making money and, and those, those issues. Um, so as a result of that, I think the Tea Party, you're going to find them conservative, uh, even on the cultural side, just because of where these members come from. Uh, that's their local base. Now, I'll just say there's a huge debate going on in the Republican Party and in the conservative movement now in terms of moving away from some of those basic issues. Uh, CPAC, which has their annual uh, uh, enclave in Washington every year, this year for the first time, has invited some gay, lesbian, conservative groups to come and protest. And as a result of that, other groups have pulled out. So this is a tension within the party, part of its generational, part of its regional. It's going to be interesting to watch how this unfolds. But the Tea Party, at its base, is, is not cultural. It is uh, basically founded on uh, going uh, a frustration with the high unemployment rate, of course. But the, uh, it, it's all about the debt. It's all about taxes. It's all about those kind of interventionist uh, issues. The fact remains, though, that a number of these members elected with the Tea Party come from pretty culturally uh, conservative areas, and they have to mind that store as well as they address these issues. And as I think I put it in that. In that uh, so that gets frame. to Ray's point that we may see some strange alliances. We may see mm -hmm. the left and the right team up on some issues. Ray, do you want to add to that? Yeah, on the on the privacy issue, you know. It, it, there are several things here. I mean, one, what we want to avoid is sort of a jurisdictional battle between FCC and, I mean, FTC and the uh, Commerce. And um, Senator Kerry, of course, is looking to put forward a bill about a bill of rights, eight, eight basic rights around privacy. On the privacy issue, what I would like to see, regardless of who's in power, is, is that we're data-driven and that we actually analyze and have hearings and discuss what the issues actually are and the economic impact because this is an area where we have to really examine about the rule of unintended consequences and take a look at our economy, this growing apps economy that we have um, where applications are exploding, many of the small businesses, but many of them rely on certain um, mechanisms for their monetization. And so a broad sweep of regulation in Congress to sort of say, let's have tough privacy could have huge economic uh, impacts. So I think we all need to kind of take a breath and understand what the different issues are. And that's where there may be some interesting alliances where, you know, you would ordinarily say, well, conservative, light touch on regulation, but then you may see folks from a cultural perspective say, 
well, let's say certain things can't happen uh, on the Internet. Well, that's heavy regulation. So it, there will be some interesting coming togethers of different coalitions, I think. Rick, you lived through some of these issues. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I do think uh, it's hard to say how some of these cultural values play on, on some of the issues, like on privacy. You know, you don't, you don't exactly know where that's going to come down on, on uh, protecting children on the Internet. Maybe you have a little clearer picture, picture of that. But I really do think many of the issues that uh, we face in the technology community are, don't quite break down on those lines. There, there is some, some room for, for surprising alliances. I will say issues having to do with spending money you know, uh, probably do break down pretty easily for the Tea Party people. And I think you're going to see, and I think it's probably a positive thing, that, you know, less focus on, or less willingness to support a big national broadband build-out uh, or, or something like that. Moving on to another issue. Um, a lot of the tech associations have put trade back at the top of their priority list for the first time. And I would be interested in hearing where you all think um, some of the conservative members might be on trade. Do you think they'll approach it from a more protectionist point of view, or do you think they will welcome more um, global competition, innovation, and, um, and support free trade agreements like the Korean, Colombian, Panama agreements? Me, Tom? I'll, I'll, I'll get started on that. Uh, the votes have been there, in my opinion, to pass these agreements forever. Those three. I mean, Panama, who cares? Uh, Colombia has been our strongest. I mean, it's just no economic. In Colombia, our markets are already open to Colombia. They just want the permanency. And uh, with Uribe, Colombia was our strongest ally in the Western Hemisphere. And had it come to the House floor for a vote, I think, uh, but Pelosi wouldn't bring it up. And the administration didn't want to uh, 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 go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their labor base. Uh, it, it never came up. It looks like now Korea, they've negotiate, renegotiated a bit. But uh, those votes are certainly there in the House. Uh, these Tea Party folks may split on that, depending where they're from, again, what they see the, the local import in their factories. But you're going to see the House far more uh, free trade uh, than the previous House. Previous House couldn't do it because the labor unions are such an important part of the Democratic coalition. They couldn't afford that crack. And they couldn't deliver on some other issues, uh, uh, like card check, uh, which were a little more radioactive to independent uh, voters. So they used a, a trade as a result of that. Uh, what, what surprises me is that economically, with so many trade agreements being negotiated around the world, we're just not privy to them. We're falling further and further behind. And you talk about these three agreements, which have basically been on the shelf. It's almost an embarrassment that, that Congress and the administration haven't moved faster on these. The question is, what's beyond that? We have a lot of issues to the tech community uh, that are important after these agreements around the world. And we see our competitors, whether they're, it's China, uh, whether it's Europe, uh, you know, working on these, negotiating, opening markets, and we're being shut out. So, President, who but is But this is a town. free trade Congress. I, I think this will be a free trade Congress. They're really the balls in the administration's court, and they can't behind, hide behind the fact that they couldn't get it through Congress now. So, President, who is wheels down in Washington this afternoon, and um, you mentioned China. Where do you think that... Well, I don't know if they wanted to add, would comment on what I said on trade. Do you agree with that? Would you basically agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think part, part of the issue you're facing, too, is that um, free trade agreements are not necessarily as popular with the American people as that they might have been at one point. We've had multiple Wall Street Journal polls where um, people have expressed concerns about what free trade agreements have done to yeah. the American economy and, and, and the loss of American jobs. And so you're seeing more uneasiness just amongst the populace about this, and that, that could possibly play into this a little bit, that the people might be a little bit more hesitant sometimes to... to to sign on to some of these agreements. I'm not sure Panama is the one, but. Ray, where's TechNet on these? Oh, I, I'm, I'm where uh, Congressman Davis is, is on this, and um, I think he sort of summarized the politics. It really is in the hands of where the administration wants to go, because I do think it'll be a much more uh, friendly environment for, for free trade, and, and most of our companies are, are in favor of that. I mean, the, the issue um, around sort of trade or, or sort of foreign policy is really around issues of intellectual property protection, those sorts of issues, and what the U.S. posture is, is going to be. I mean, what we've had recently is a lot of sort of foreign policy, trade policy being articulated by companies and in their interactions with China 
um, and, and having to assert things without having the U.S. get out there and be a little bit more assertive. So it's very much like, let's see how that interplay will be with Congress, which I think Congress is probably going to be a little bit more aggressive, sort of saying we've got to draw the line. We'll see where that moves the administration. Now, you, you see with, with the Chinese president uh, coming here, you, you see Senator Schumer and others sort of laying down a marker um, on certain issues around currency and wanting mm -hmm. China to be labeled as a currency manipulator um, for WTO standards. Um, I'm not sure how that will permeate through the rest of Congress, but you can see, even on the Democratic side, some movement there. So IP. Um, Tea Party members might look at it as a protection of private property rights, or they might look at a government granted monopoly um, and be concerned about in furthering um, intellectual property protections. Where do you all think things will come down? You know, I spent the last two years founding a company that has a little uh, IP analytics site on the, on the internet. And so I spent a lot of time worrying about some of these issues. And I can tell you the, the, uh, the inventor in his garage, in a lot of ways, is a Tea Party person. I mean, there is, there's a crossover there between uh, the person who's out there trying to invent the next best thing and people who believe in the Tea Party. Um, but having said that, I, I still think that for people who come back here as elected you know, representatives, um, these issues still will probably not be at the top, on the top, top of their mind. I see Tim has joined us on the podium, and I suspect that um, it's probably time to open up for some Q&As from the audience, and uh, who wants to go first? Any questions out there? He's got one right here. All right, Jerry. Yeah, I, I don't care. Yeah. That song has been around in the internet space for a long time. The, I want to go back to the net neutrality issue because one of the glories of the internet, after it was left DARPA, the government, became commercialized, was that it, everyone had access to it. It was this great democratic <coughs> communications media where everyone could communicate. What was driving that was common carriage on the telephone network and a multiple set of I, ISPs that were providing connection to the internet. We're now down to two ISPs, phone and cable, and we don't have a common carriage rule. So if net neutrality isn't the answer, what is the answer to ensuring that everyone on the internet can reach everyone else, which is a fundamental distinguisher of the internet from any other communications medium? Well, I don't know if you well, want to I'll start. I'll start with that, just because I think, you know, the answer is the same as the answer we had 15 years ago, we don't know the answer, and we probably shouldn't think we're smart enough to figure it out. I mean, that's, that's always been my, my opinion, that it's, a, it's an evolving situation. You know, we didn't have the kind of, we didn't anticipate the kind of wireless connectivity that we have now uh, 15 years ago. And there's lots of things, I'm sure, 15 years from now that we won't have anticipated too. So I think it's really just a matter of um, whether you have more confidence in the, you know, the rough process of commerce and people, you know, f to figure these things out, or more confidence in people like the FCC. I usually came down on the commerce side, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way to go. And I think, uh, I, I personally think it's good for us to be a little more comfortable with a little more, uh, you know, confusion, because uh, that prevents us from, from stopping things that might otherwise happen. Good yeah, things. And I'd like to add to that a couple things. One is we have to make sure that, that competition um, can thrive uh, in the marketplace. And so as Rick said, you know, the wireless explosion has been helpful from a, from a competition perspective. The other thing is just very, very basic, and it was reflected in the past couple of years, absence of data. Um, and so you, you see the FCC and Commerce trying to acquire data both on um, adoption um, of broadband, but also on spectrum and a number of other issues. We simply don't have all the data that we need. And so our perspective is let's make more decisions data-driven, um, and let's, let's make sure we acquire that. So I think this is a good step in terms of acquiring data. It seems like also, um, you know, I think earlier during the discussion we were talking about how this creates uncertainty for the markets when you don't have rules. I mean, arguably, the net, the net neutrality rules that we now have are still going to create that uncertainty because you're going to have um, a, you're going to have a judicial review, which you probably would have had no matter what they did. Um, it might have been easier, frankly, for them to just pass Title II 
uh, rules and, and be done with it, uh, but they chose not to go that route. I mean, another option, of course, is just for Congress to pass law, a law saying that the FCC has the authority to protect transparency or some of these other things that everybody seems to agree is, is a good thing. Um, and, you know, Congress could do that. They could give the FCC more obvious authority on this issue. I don't know if that's possible. But do you do you think the Tea Party is likely to want to give an agency more authority? No. Yeah, there's no question about it. They don't. But you know, again, um, um, they're going to be focused on a lot of issues, most of which are not going to be based in the FCC. I mean, I think net neutrality probably is one right. exception. Can I do one follow-up? Sure. Just, it's, confusion is confusion is fine, and you know, I'm not a big regulator. Uh, never was for that. But the question is whether the Tea Party or the new conservatives share that vision of an open Internet. The congresswoman who just spoke talked about everyone having consumer devices. The Internet wasn't based on consumption and, and as of content by big providers, but that everyone could create content and create applications. And it's that Internet that I'm worried about and whether we share that value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually think that's a good point. I, I do think that, um, um, you know, these issues of, well, where the Tea Party comes from seems to be, uh, you know, more aligned with, with the uh, classic market, you know, approach of the Republicans. But actually, a lot of these cultural values get lost when you really have to, have to really submit yourself to the discipline of the marketplace. So I don't think it's a, it's a done deal in terms of exactly how that would go. I think you might find people more willing to regulate uh, on the right in some issues than people on the left might be. Can I also, I mean, I don't think the average member understands this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that may shock people out here in the audience. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, these members get elected. This wasn't an issue in the campaign. It's not something they paid a lot of attention to. They may have a philosophical bent. The interesting thing on net neutrality is how partisan this has gotten, whether it's the FCC vote, whether it's how it's broken down in Congress. Uh, I, I wouldn't bet on that being the way it ends up at the end of the day once the interest groups have weighed in and, and everybody's properly educated. But that's where it is today, and that's the starting point. And I think that makes it harder for Congress to act and why the FCC is filled the void. Any other questions? Well, I We've got one right here. Uh, right. Okay, fantastic. We actually have a few minutes. I think we've probably got another 10 minutes or yep. so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Um, to follow up, I think Elizabeth raised an interesting point. Um, and I think we would all agree that there's probably no system of regulation that's more complex than the tax regulatory system, with the possible exception of intellectual property and copyright, which has an awful lot of very convoluted rules and requirements and exceptions. Um, to the extent that some of the new members of Congress come to understand that intellectual property regulation or intellectual property is valuable as it can be, nevertheless that the regulation is regulation of information regulation of knowledge flow, and that it is a very complex government regulatory system, do you think there's an opening for them to start doing some cost-benefit analysis of the way in which that regulatory system uh, operates and its structure? Yeah, let, uh, let me just say, I mean, the average member, this is the furthest thing from their mind. I, I saw <laughs> around the corner they have the American wheat growers. I mean, if you're from Kansas or you're from North Dakota, that's where you're spending your time today. You're not in here. Uh, mem members are great generalists. They uh, are responsive to what's going on in their districts. We could have a long dissertation on how uh, you know, the TechNet and the Northern Virginia Technology Council and some of these other groups, uh, were, uh, Tech America, how they've tried to work together to focus on this. Uh, there's a huge learning curve for these new members. And I think it's, you know, uh, what happens next is really going to be up to the people in this room. Uh, I think you're dealing with a blank sheet of paper with a lot of these members. They have a philosophical a f a philosophy in general, but this is tremendously complex, whereas we've seen from some of these other uh, questions and comments today, you get a lot of overlap uh, between liberals, conservatives, Republicans, and Democrats, and how it ferrets out. So really, I think uh, how we handle this from here is going to determine the outcome. Yeah, I was going to say you were giving a, having a lot of faith in members of Congress. I think they're going to go through the cost-benefit analysis of intellectual property you know, details. But I do think, I guess the other thing I would say in addition to what Tom says is that uh, what they will do is uh, follow their, their leaders 
or their, uh, the people who become the leaders in certain areas in Congress. So I don't know if it's someone like Representative Blackburn or others, but I think, frankly, for this community to build up the right kind of technology leaders in each caucus would be a valuable thing because the people who, uh, who don't really spend a lot of time focusing on those issues themselves will follow people who they do think have focused on it and whose values they respect. So that's probably you know, your best way to get something done. Hi, Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. Amy, you mentioned an issue that's a lot simpler, even for Congress, than net neutrality. It was universal service reform. You talked about the attractiveness of an $8 billion annual subsidy, but the radioactiveness of the issue. And uh, I would wonder if the panelists think that Congress might sort of take this away from the FCC and figure out a way to let people use that subsidy to buy broadband if they want or rural telephone if they feel like it. The issue with, with universal service, you've got, you've got substantive issues, you have political issues. And, and the political side, it, it unfortunately too often breaks down to winners and losers, rural versus non-rural. So you've got those. But on substance, I think there's broad agreement on some of the components of universal service. So you've got E-rate, where there's been a lot of support around that. You know, lifeline, link up, you know, there, there's some support. The question comes down to how we define uh, what principles drive subsidy. And we, one, we have to make sure that it's driven more, in my opinion, this is opinion, has to be driven more toward broadband um, versus phone, which seems obvious, but there will be people fighting to keep you know, phone-related subsidies. So I'm interested in making sure we get some broadly defined principles that will drive the key things around, around that. And then it gets down to, you look at E-rate, well, schools are eligible. Do we want to make any other kinds of facilities uh, uh, eligible for that? Do we get creative and say, well, maybe libraries should be part of that. Maybe public housing should be part of that. It's all within the same rubric of the $8.5 billion, but I think we need to have a real conversation about what should be driving um, that from a values standpoint. What do we value? Um, what's important to us uh, in society? And I'm looking forward to that, to that debate. Remember when universal service was like, what, $4 billion a year? Now, like, we're talking it's going to be close to nine. I mean, it's really getting big, and it's really hard to take that away from a rural phone company somewhere if you're going to take their support away and, and you know, take away their dividends. It's going to be a real fight, and you do have these issues where every district, you've got folks on both sides, and this is one where it's really hard. It's hard to change it, much less try to rescind this thing. I mean, it's so enormous at this point, and you've got, you know, the schools and libraries funds who you're going to take funding away from your kid's school? Like, who, does, who votes for that? I mean, that's crazy. No one's going to do that. So. And Steve, remember, you need 60 votes in the Senate, right. you need a majority in the House, and you need the administration to sign off on the same version. And that, that's tough. So I keep hearing that we're going to see regional divides, that the Tea Party is not going to be monolithic. The conservatives will not stand together on, on a lot of these issues that we care about. So I am interested. I'm going to, to play John Dingell, um, the former chairman John Dingell, and try to pin you down on some of these issues. And when he questions witnesses, he often asks for a yes or a no. I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to ask for a hands-off, as in hands-off on the issue, let the free market work, or hands-on. Um, I'm going to go down a list of issues and see where you all fall. Are you asking where we are? Or where we are? I'm going to wear where you think the Tea Party will oh, be. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, first one. Nothing to lose. <laughs> Net neutrality. Hands-on, hands-off. Hands-off. Hands on. Oh, a hands on in a sense of repeal? Right. Oh. Hands on. Yeah. Hands on in terms of, yes, they will repeal. Hands okay. on. They're against net neutrality. All right. Right. Um, privacy. Will hands on, will they, will they pass legislation or hands off? I'll go hands off. It's divided, but hands off. Hands off. Well, maybe hands on? I don't know. Yeah, I can see them on both sides. I, of the fence. I think you could have people on both sides. All right, so when you throw children in there. Oh. Hands on. Hands on, totally. Little kids. Yeah, protect the kids. kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, will we see internet gambling revisited? Hands on, hands off. I'm going to go hands off. Hands off. Hands off. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think we'll see it revisited, but I, don't, I think it's hands-off, too. Okay. Um, on patent reform, we've talked a lot about intellectual property on the copyright side, but will Congress pass comprehensive patent reform, hands-on or hands-off? Yeah, hands-off. It won't be comprehensive. If they do something, they'll, it'll be nibbling around, around the edges, and there's some things around fixing the patent office and some things like that that need to get done, but the whole word comprehensive, I don't see that coming together. I agree with that. I think it'll be niche. Uh, you, you, you'll get some niche fixes. and you, you only get it if leadership wants it, because they're not going to get that focused on this. It's really hard. And the Tea Party guys will be on both sides of it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Rewriting the 96 Act. Do you think there's an appetite? It, it, it won't get rewritten in the next two years. I mean, I just have to phrase, I don't see it getting rewritten in the next year and a half. You know, you may see a marker, but these things take years to, to rewrite. You may get a marker down somewhere that somebody puts down. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at that, but seeing it done in this two-year period. Th this two-year period is just a, basically spring training for the presidential election in 2012. That's right. So each party's testing out its messages, and, and this isn't part of it. I'll do a dinglish answer, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I think, again, you know, the Tea Party people won't really have a view one way or the other on this. They're going to follow the people who they think, you know, they have confidence in. So it really, it comes down to who has the gavel mm -hmm. and who the leaders in Congress are. And you really believe that the Tea Party is going to follow, follow the gavel. Well, I also think interest groups, interest groups will play a role in individual uh, areas. It's up to, you know, it, it's up to the interest groups to make their pitch to each member. And I think you'll find in varying districts that they may, be, they may join uh, hands as uh, Tea Party members, but on some of these issues, which are issues of first impression to their uh, electorate, uh, I, I think it's up for grabs. It depends on how everybody organizes and educates them. Yeah, I agree that a lot of it's up for grabs. I would also say, though, that you know, it's not necessarily the leadership that they follow. It's not necessarily the committee chairman. It's the people who know something about these issues, right. whose values they have, you know, they respect, or people who they admire, who they agree with in general political principles, and who also happen to know something about these interests, about these issues. That's the people they'll follow, not necessarily the leadership. So it Sometimes sounds, that's, you know, the other way around. Sounds like people in this room have a lot of work to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Other questions? This community has always had a lot of work to do. So. Uh, Morgan Reed with ACT. Uh, this, I guess, is for Tom as much as anyone. I was great to hear you talk about um, free trade agreements and globalization. Uh, one of the things that's difficult is now uh, a recent Pew study came out and said that only 17% of America believes that globalization is a net positive for the United States. That's down from previous years where it's been in the high 50s, then kind of slid into the 40s, but 17 is unprecedented. So how do we as folks who see globalization as important to the tech community deal with the messaging where we're dealing with only 17% folks of, uh, of folks on our side? Well, it, look, you don't have to like it. It's just the fact of life. It's the steamroller. You can either get on the steamroller or you can become part of the pavement. I mean, the reality is globalization is, is, is in point of fact, it's the economic system that's developed post-Cold War. And whether we like it or not, uh, it's going to continue. We can then decide to adjust to it and try to do as much, get as much favorable out of it, or we can withdraw, as we have done in some circumstances. But it is the economic reality. It's a hard message to deliver when you've got people out there, messages of darkness, trying to deny its existence. And we have a lot of members who do that. I've been in small meetings. I, I, you got to believe they know better, but I'm, I'm not sure that they always do, uh, because everybody looks at it through the prism of their district. But the reality is we need to do a better job of educating people. But it's, it's there, and leaders understand it's going to be there. And if we don't make adjustments to it, uh, we're going to get, become part of the pavement. I also think when the economy improves, our impression of the globalization will improve, too. So we're at a time now where it's probably at a low, and it's probably on its way back up, hopefully. Anybody have anything else to add? Tim has uh, signaled that it's time to end this panel. So thanks, everyone, for your participation. Please give them a round of applause.